So welcome to our final session, Voices of the Future. And I'm delighted to open the first of three sessions giving conference space to the challenges facing emerging sector professionals. These sessions and this session looks at the inspirational and pioneer work of two organizations, Arts Emergency and the New Museum School. Karantama Anumadu, Community Manager at Arts Emergency, opens our session, followed by Vanessa Otim and Errol Francis from the New Museum School. So Karantama, welcome and over to you. Hi, <laughs> sorry that took me ages. Hi, nice to be here. Um, my name is Karantama. Um, I'm the Community Manager at Arts Emergency um, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, who we are, what we do um, and what we feel the barriers to social justice are and what we're currently doing about it. Um, but before I get started, uh, I thought we could play a little game. So we always do this at the beginning of Arts Emergency events. Um, if in the chat, could you just post what you wanted to be when you were 17 years old? So for me, I wanted to um, play for Leighton Orient Football Club, <laughs> which was a reach as I didn't play football. Um, and I'm obviously not doing anything like that now. So I'll give people a minute to do that. And then in the chat, can you put yes or no if you're doing something vaguely similar to that job that you wanted to be when you were 17? So the reason why we do that exercise is because um, when you're 16 or 17, it's really hard to know what you want to do, what you want to be. Um, and there are lots of things that stop you from having that knowledge. Um, and that's kind of where Arts Emergency steps in. So fundamentally, we help young people who are underrepresented in the even cultural industries get a fair start. Um, so we say that they have a right to do the things that they want to do. They have a right to try different things out and explore and be curious. Um, we uh, are a mentoring charity, um, but also a support network. So we have about 7,000 people who signed up to say that they want to um, volunteer and help young people get to where they want to be. Um, and we cover the arts and humanities. So we're called Arts Emergency, but we also cover things like journalism, politics, English related industries, obviously heritage um, and the humanities. Um, our biggest projects are in London um, and we're also working in Greater Manchester. And this year we started working in Merseyside for the first time, um, but we also have over 18s who are from all over the UK. So um, East and West Midlands. And this year we had our first two Scottish um, uh, young people, which is quite exciting. Um, and overall we have about a thousand young people we're working with in lots of different capacities. So we started in 2013 um, and we were founded by Josie Long and Neil Griffiths, who kind of sat down in the bookshop and said, uh, we need to do something to help working class kids um, get into the arts, um, because that was their background and they felt that there was something missing. Um, and they wrote Festo. So this is one of our manifesto points. It says, we are a social justice, not social mobility organisation. Arts Emergencies Institute for Justice with Health. So we believe that social mobility doesn't do enough. It doesn't address the inequalities that exist. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the problems um, that exist in the arts and humanities. And I think a lot of these um, people here are probably very aware of already. So a couple of years ago in 2018, we partnered on this report called the Panic Report um, with uh, academics from the University of Edinburgh and Sheffield and Create London and the Barbican. Um, it 
had it against an arts emergency and it kind of went into the different barriers that exist currently in the creative and cultural industries. I'm going to talk about some of the main takeaways that came from this report um, and how it's relevant to what we do at Arts Emergency. So some of these figures are probably quite familiar. Um, as you can see here, 2.7% um, of workers in museums, galleries and libraries are from Black, Asian and other minority ethnic backgrounds. Uh, you can see that there's only 12.6% um, of people from working class origin working in public and so on and so on. The, the stats are quite depressing, um, but also I think what is um, very obvious is that these stats haven't really changed for, uh, for decades. Um, so there hasn't really been much movement on that. So one of the main takeaways from this report is that meritocracy does not exist. So meritocracy is a myth. Um, and by meritocracy, we mean the belief that if you work hard to get to where you want to be, then you'll get there, no matter what your background. Um, and unsurprisingly, uh, the people who believe in meritocracy are the people who tend to have the most power. So the people who are in higher up, higher up positions and those people tend to be um, white, Middle class men. Um, as a little example, apologies if any of you are Stephen King fans, but this is a tweet from uh, 2019. Um, and the diversity issue that Stephen King is talking about, um, he says that he would, I would never consider diversity in matters of art only quality. It seems to me that to do otherwise would be wrong. So if you think about the backlash that comes when people talk about inclusivity and representation, it becomes quite clear um, who doesn't agree with those things. The second takeaway from the report is that connections really matter. So who you know really matters. Um, and before I talk a little bit more about that, um, I thought I'd do another little exercise. So I'm going to read out um, some job titles and in like in a note paper or um, on your phone or whatever um, write down the job title if you know someone who does it and not someone that you hire so I'm going to read out a few job titles if you know someone who does that job write down that title so the first one is a lecturer a curator an actor, a journalist, an artist, architect, author, nurse, A bus driver, a secretary, a factory worker, plumber, postman. and a cleaner. So remember, these are people that you don't hire. These are people who might be your friends or family members. So looking at your list, this graphic from the report showed that people who work in cultural and creative industries have really limited social circles. So um, you're more likely to know other people who work in creative and cultural industries if you do work in them yourself. Um, and that means that people who come from more traditional working class roles like um, bus driver, uh, bank managers, postmen, factory workers, cleaners, clerical officers um, are less likely to have those networks around them. And if you have, you know, that really well connected uncle who can kind of like slip you in the back door on an internship or work experience placement, you're more likely to get experience that other people um, of your peers will not get. And the last takeaway um, from the report is that people in the arts generally think they're super liberal, um, but they're not. <laughs> um, so what I mean by that is that uh, people who work in creative and cultural industries are more likely to identify as politically left 
um, and as politically liberal. Um, but are they really when the pervasive like racist, sexist, class issues still exist in the arts and still and have done for for many, many years? Um, so being ideologically left isn't isn't quite enough. So all of that together, so the belief in meritocracy, um, the connections and um, thinking that you're um, liberal but not, that just means that a lot of people feel really shut out um, from the industries. And this is something that we, we all, we all um, hopefully know by now. Um, and the young people that we work with um, feel really, really frustrated. Um, it feels like you're looking from the outside in, you're working twice as hard, but you're not getting anywhere and you don't really know why. And I think a lot of um, experience of people who come from working class backgrounds or from minoritized backgrounds is very similar and that feeling doesn't tend to go away even if you do end up working in those industries um, and like funny enough that when I started working at Arts Emergency about um, five years ago um, I was like just on the cusp of not being a young person anymore I was just 24 about to turn 25 um, and I was really looking for some opportunities um, I found it really difficult um, I was on a traineeship and felt really unwelcome um, in the heritage institution that I was. Uh, and those nuanced things that you carry with you, that baggage that you carry with you, is really hard to, to put words to and vocabulary to. And that some of that takes such a long time to, to work out. So we're working a lot with the young people on, on nuanced things like um, how to deal with microaggressions, how to deal with imposter syndrome, what your rights at work are, how to deal with HR departments, um, how to find allies in the workplace, because we know that those are issues that are coming up um, and, are, and are still uh, prevalent today. Uh, so yeah, we understand that to make it in the creative and cultural industries, you need these three things. So you need connections, you need knowledge on what exists, and you need the confidence. And confidence isn't just sort of confidence in yourself to apply for jobs, but it's also the confidence to, to feel that you ex have the right to exist in those spaces and the spaces that have been um, unwelcome. Um, we do that in kind of a number of ways. So we run mentoring programs um, for young people. So they come to us when they're 16, 17, they have a mentor for a year, and then they stay in our young community until they are um, 20 six years old, which means that most of them get about eight years of support. So they might come to us um, deciding what to do for their A-levels and then will leave us hopefully when they have their first, their first entry level job in the career that they want. We also share um, high quality opportunities with them. Um, that's work experience, work placements, and we also act as a resource for them too. Um, so they can ask us questions about um, career choices or um, what education is like or whether they should do that masters or not. And as well as that, um, as I mentioned, we have the support network, so um, our volunteers. And this is what we generally ask them to do. So we believe it's really important to influence gatekeepers to make the change um, inside their own organisations. And we ask them to do by showing their privilege, by putting their promises into action, um, and by looking at their own work culture. And um, as I sort of mentioned, like culture change is a thing I think that we're finding most difficult at the moment because we spent all these years building up young people, um, you know, running workshops, giving them skills, making them feel really confident that they can apply for these jobs and they can get a career and they can do what they want. And then when they do step into those places, they immediately bounce back out again because they don't feel supported in them. And that's really frustrating <laughs> because uh, you can try and, you know, teach young people to be really resilient but at the end of the day, it's not their job to be resilient. It is the, the culture's job, it is the organization's job to be a less damaging place for those young people. Um, so for maybe a couple of minutes, um, think about two practical, actionable things that you can do to make your workspace feel um, safer and fairer. And I'll put a timer on.
you have a minute left. That is time. So thinking about what is happening at the moment and what the future might hold. Um, obviously, the last year has been completely wild um, and the effects on young people, on minoritized genders, on black and brown people, on working class people has been really, really tough. Um, I think the things that we found um, our young people have been feeling is general like lack of positivity about the future, feeling like um, the careers that they wanted to go in now seem even further away, um, that their mental health is suffering, that they feel lonely, that they just feel um, like there isn't <laughs> that much hope. Um, but having said that, um, I feel like there is no better time than now to act and to make a proper change. Um, this year, we, so we had applications open um, in September. We had three times the amount of applications than we ever have before. Um, and I think that is a testament to what is going on at the moment and the help that people think that they need. Um, but it also means that we have like quite a lot of work to do. Um, when I started um, at Arts Emergency, there were three of us and now there are 12. So we're growing and there's a lot more ways that we can support young people, um, but it's still a massive challenge. Um, but we, we've just like launched a youth collective, which is really exciting, who are looking at campaigning and how they can build a community among the young people we work with. So they have their peers as they go on and as they progress. Um, and we're growing nationally every year to kind of work in places that are more geographically isolated or further away from cultural hubs. Um, and continuing, I think, to build trust is really important, like building trust among the young people that we work with um, and challenging ourselves as well as we challenge the people who support us too. Um, so talking of support, if you would like to help Arts Emergency, um, there are a few ways you can do that. Um, so you can join our network uh, if you go to our website, which is arts-emergency.org. And when you do that, um, you can sign up to as a mentor. We train mentors every year in the autumn. You can check our wish list. So the wish list is um, a place where young people can ask us for whatever they want. And then we ask our network. So it might be, um, I would like a book on how to audition, or I would like to meet someone who works in broadcast journalism, or I would like to work with a curator and ask them questions. Um, and then we ask our network and then we make it happen. Um, you can offer us work experience placements um, and you can definitely offer us a paid placement. And this is something that we, um, would love to build on this year. So we're getting more and more and more requests from young people asking for paid entry level jobs, especially as a lot of them have lost um, their jobs over the pandemic as a lot of people have. Um, and you can also donate. So we're mainly funded by people giving their equivalent of um, 10 pound a month. Um, so if you can donate, um, that's also um, really well received. And that is uh, really it. It's a whistle sort tour of our emergency and what we do. Um, one last thing is uh, this is another one of our manifesto points about the future. And we really are, I think we usually say we are like militantly optimistic. Uh, so there's always like uh, lots of hope for the future. Um, and we do believe that um, better things could be on the way. Um, thank you. And I think we have maybe 10 minutes for questions. I'm going to stop sharing. Yes. One of the questions I was asking, you've answered beautifully in your last PowerPoint, but um, there is another question from Victoria, which is really any 
Any advice on how arts emergencies engaging with mentees during COVID? Yeah, um, so it was really challenging, I think, as it has probably been for lots of organisations, but um, I would say that our pastoral care, um, that is what we kind of concentrated on as soon as COVID hit. So we like call our young people regularly. Um, we're running a lot more like workshops online. Um, and we, the, so the mentoring that's happened has moved online as well. And we've like produced lots of guidance and support on that. Um, but I would say like the pastoral care has been actually the thing that's been most, um, most important throughout this year. Um, like creating spaces for young people to talk to each other as well so they don't feel isolated but also just like checking in and having a 15 minute phone call every week um, and I think that's actually probably been the majority of a lot of our jobs um, over the last year which is which has been really really great. Great and correct me there's a, a question about uh, what arts emergency plans are to expand I mean Manchester and Merseyside are particularly mentioned but could you just talk a little bit about how you see that roll out? Yeah, so um, there's on our website, there's uh, something called the future is another place, which is our, our like future growth plan. Um, but we've identified areas in the UK that we feel where we have like the right amount of support and also places that need the most um, support for young people accessing the arts. Um, and the plan is to set up projects in those different areas over the next five years. Um, at the moment, I would say that so this year was the first year that we opened up applications to over 18s who live anywhere in the UK and that's been really really great so yeah I, like I mentioned we have young people from the East Midlands, young people from Scotland, um, from Plymouth, um, from Wales um, and I think the good thing about the pandemic has meant that it's easier for people to do things from all over the place from all over the country um, but we're also wary that the, the great thing about the programme the great thing about arts emergency is that as well as mentoring you also get all these other things you also get chances to go on trips um like you get chances to um meet other young people you get the opportunity to do events and things like that which where it's really important for there to be a community of people in your place um so i say it's probably going to change a little bit because of this last year um but there are still hopes to to go into different cities um every year Great. Thank you. And thank you, Danica, for asking that uh, uh, question. And then uh, Dana's posted a question. It, it it's really focuses on what your advice would be um, what, for the kind of support to keep young people in feeling supported in their creative job. What would make the difference uh, for them to stay in their chosen field? I think that is a question that organizations maybe need to ask themselves a little bit so there's there's something that like when when you are speaking from personal experience um as a black woman going into spaces that um do not feel welcoming to you that's that's something that you it it, it affects you every day um so like I mentioned, you can you can tell a young person to be resilient and you can direct them to where to get help if they experience microaggressions or racism or discrimination at work. Um, but to get to the root of why those things are happening um, is a question that I think organisations need to work through. Um, and, you know, that might be, do you have any senior leaders who are um, people of colour or who have disabilities or who come from working class backgrounds, um, like, you know, questioning, do you have paid opportunities? Do you have progress routes for people? So they're not just lots of brown people in entry level jobs, and then they kind of don't get promoted and they leave. There's lots of different, um, lots of different layers to it. Um, and lots of questions that I think organizations need to ask themselves depending on where they are. Um, don't know if that answered the question. I think it, it did. It's almost as if you've got to mentor the institution alongside the mentees that you're, you're taking. <laughs> um, I think that brings us to the last of our, our questions and it rounds us very neatly to the end of our session. Thank you so much. Karen, to me, you're going to stay on uh, and we will maybe round up a little discussion together. So I'm now going to move on 
to Errol Francis and Vanessa. And we've been reading a lot, Errol and Vanessa, about the relaunch and new plans for your new museum school. So uh, can I ask you to start, Errol, and tell us a little bit about what you've been planning and delivering this year? Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Catherine. Um, I'm just going to try and share my screen. Um, and just bear with me for a moment. Uh, right. Um, uh, oops. Uh, right. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be invited um, to make this presentation and really exciting to be doing it with Vanessa Oteem, who's one of uh, the graduates of the New Museum School, and she's going to follow um, what I say, um, but I'm going to have to be quick because I don't want to eat in on Vanessa's time because she's going to share some of the work she did at the um, New Museum School. Um, but I, I, I'm going to um, start by just saying um, what we do briefly. We are around to open up who makes and enjoys arts and heritage. That means who works in the sector and who is the audience. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk about the New Business School Advanced Programme, but I'm going to start with talking about the Black Lives Matter Charter, which is a product of the New Museum School and very much addresses um, the uh, issues that emerged last summer in particular, and which many, much of which we're trying to address with the new museum school advanced program that I'm going to be talking about. So um, just to tell you, I'm not going to read the whole charter, but just to say it exists, why it exists, you can read it on our website. But that the reason why we felt it necessary to publish this charter was really, it was inspired actually by the statements of solidarity, which came out from various her heritage organizations. And we felt that this, these statements of horror about what happened in the, the United States with George Floyd should be followed up with actions. And we felt there was some confusions about what people should do. So we wanted to be offer some clarity. So it talks about things like decolonizing collections, imperial narratives, um, and uh, uh, restitution, for example, um, being accountable um, and to protect, the, and this is referencing something that uh, Karantima just mentioned, which is the health and well being of, of people in their workforce in relation to na navigating and challenging racism, and of course, addressing issues relating to the pandemic. But what an, an, an important part of the um, charter is addressing. The workforce and that's what um, the new museum school does has been doing and will continue to do and we're very proud to say that that really depressing figure that you heard from Karen Timmer about 2.7 percent is not does not reflect the graduates of um, at the new museum school they, they reflect the diversity of the UK in every dimension in terms of social class sexuality um, cultural background um, uh, uh, and neurodiversity. Um, so we're very proud of that record and we've um, been doing the, the, the program for five um, years. We have 130 graduates and the issue is that they've hit a glass ceiling. And um, again, you heard that in the, in the presentation about the lack of progression within the sector and we really want to tackle that. So that's the reason why we're, we're launching New Museum School Advanced Programme. Um, it builds on our experience of delivering a diploma. It's a key objective in the Black Lives Matter Charter to address the lack of uh, career progression, to provide confidence to our heritage partners to um, embrace change and to, to nurture the diverse talent and leadership that we have in the sector that will contribute to expanding um, audiences. Um, we're working with the University of Leicester, um, number of cultural partners and the Esme Fairbairn Foundation and I'm really excited to say and I've only just had this email um, this afternoon um, the Sotheby's um, the Sotheby's Institute of Art uh, and we see the private sector art world as a key um, place to diversify because it's even less diverse than the public sector. So the aim of the programme is to nurture the brightest, most promising talent that can be the future leaders in the arts and heritage workforce. 
we want to provide a distance learning, flexible, most pr uh, modular postgraduate qualification that will allow professionals to continue full-time employment within the arts and heritage sector while studying and to ensure that there's an accessible recruitment process for the learners um, with wide ranging backgrounds. And we want to ex expand the expert um, knowledge of diverse arts and heritage professionals across the range of um, disciplines. Um, so we want to support the um, participants to advance their careers and to also build a self-sustaining self network by brokering one-to-one -one mentoring and networking opportunities and to increase access to accreditation of various um, uh, professional bodies and to make real step changes in how heritage is interpreted and and to expand audiences and we want to change and improve the UK arts and heritage organizations in terms of their workforce recruitment and retention from staff from diverse backgrounds so um yeah I mentioned the partners uh, this one I managed to put the Sotheby's Institute of Art there which we're very excited about um the program will um allow um, flexible pathways um, into PG DIP or MA or MSc um, qualifications, and they will undertake um, research based placements, which we're calling a project in practice with host organizations that could be remote or um, face to face, depending on the situation. Uh, the public health situation and that um, they would produce a project in practice for the host partner in return for sponsorship that's how the scheme is working and the host partners can join a network of participants um, of hosts um, committed to inclusive transformation and that the trainees um, the students will receive tailored mentoring and professional development um, support um, um, the sector hosts um, are providing um, five thousand pounds per um, um, participant um, to to cover the fees, um, the the university fees, because we recognise the economics uh, of this is a barrier uh, for people's progression, um, and the um, host partners uh, get involved in a project in pra practice, which is a um, this research that will be undertaken for, for the host organization. And so that organization will benefit from this unique piece of work to undertaken by the student. And there'll be opportunity to be part of a national initiative um, to diversify the arts and heritage workforce in the UK and support inclusive transformation across the sector. So we're very excited that we've got museums and arts organizations from right across the country from um, Scotland, down to the, the southeast in, involved in supporting the program and that this will provide um, access and involvement to those partners in an annual inclusive transformational symposium focused on inclusion in cultural settings and the processes of organizational change and the charter is going to be quite a key agenda for that inclusive transformation symposium we've really got to get on with it now we know what needs to change in the sector. We've got the research that you heard from Karan Tamit. Now we need to implement the um, findings of, of that uh, research. Um, so uh, what we want to achieve is high quality learning experience. I'm sorry for the typo, <laughs> it's just to say ethical, um, but perhaps it could mean that as well. Um, in an environment in which students can progress their studies and careers and we want to support the partners themselves in their internal conversations and programs around um, inclusive transformation. Um, we want there to be an open and collective approach to programs of change and as I've said we want to support partners to implement the Black Lives Matter Charter and to work with them on the um, inclusive um, network and symposium. So that's just a bit uh, from me there about the the program before Vanessa um, uh, makes her presentation I just wanted to, to to share with you a few of the projects that um, come out of this training the, the trainees that we've worked with and to show how the audience side of this the programs that we deliver in arts and heritage organizations how it um, is enriched and diversified 
by expanding the workforce. So, you, you know, we're not just saying about um, rights to employment um, and progression, but we're also talking about the creative output of organisations and how it can reach a more diverse audience, because that's another problem with the arts and heritage uh, sector apart from the workforce. So I just want to share you a few projects we've done recently um, with, with our trainees. Um, and um, this one, um, the Memory Archives, was delivered in 2019 at the London Metropolitan Archives. And the aim of this program was to use the archive as a, as a reminiscence device to promote um, well-being for people, for um, black elders living with dementia. And so this is an audience obviously, which uh, is not normally connected with archives. And we wanted to animate the archives by bringing the material to life in a multi-sensory way and um, to allow contact with these objects um, and to use the archive also as a space uh, of um, contemporary art. And, um, and this was co-curated by one of our new museum school um, trainees. We're repeating the um, event this year because of the pandemic, it won't be live. We're now going to be um, um, uh, engaging the audience remotely by delivering boxes archive boxes to the participants in care homes and settings and it's great that Vanessa is going to be working on that as well. Um, in 2019 we did a program with a welcome collection called Cyborgs which was looking at how we classify um, humanity um, and the living world in relation to uh, machines and technology and um, other living species and it was an intersectional um, debate and performance. Um, this is this picture is Rebent, Rebecca Ubuntu, who is the trans artist performer. And this again was a way to um, pose a very uh, important scientific question, but and to use our diverse talent from our new museum school to co-curate the, the event. Um, uh, this is the National Trust with one of our partners and Kanita Malik. She curated a, an event called um, um, the um, away, Home Away From Home, which was about um, seeing an Indian restaurant in central London as a heritage space and a space in which we could um, reconsider Indian history in relation to Brit living in, in, in Britain. Um, and so that's the end of my section and um, I want to hand over to Vanessa now. Hello, one second, just trying to sort out my computer that's decided to freak out at the final moment. And don't know if anybody can see me, possibly not. Here we go. Okay. Hi, hello everyone. Um, hi, hi Errol. <laughs> um, as Errol stated, I took part in the New Museum School in 2018 and um, where myself and the other co um, cohorts were given the opportunity to research a topic of our choice. Um, connected to our placement. I was placed um, for a year at the Royal Collection Trust as collection information trainee um, and this was to form the basis for a podcast series and uh, my episode was called The Enigmatic Face of Queen Charlotte where I analysed two portraits um, of Charlotte of mecklenburg strelitz who was the Queen Consort of George III and how the functionality of royal portraiture can be used as a means to justify and disprove the myth of her African ancestry. Um, since graduating from the New Museum School in 2019, a lot has changed socially, politically and globally, and Errol did touch on that. Movements such as Black Lives Matter has, has meant that our understanding as a collective as of race has changed in this country, or has been alluded to. And I felt like it was necessary for me to reflect on my research at my of my time at Royal Collection um, to reevaluate my perspective on the subject for cathartic reasons and because I feel like uh, the subject reveals a lot about of our understanding of race and history. Um, a disclaimer before I start: um, some of the language used to describe Charlotte's appearance and others in this presentation could be 
deemed as offensive as they're quite outdated terms, but it is integral to the research that I uncovered and I do apologize for any offense that is caused. So, okay, so the origins of the myth. So every so often articles pop up on the internet discussing this idea or notion that Britain had a black queen in Georgian, in the Georgian period. And I was first made aware, aware of this six months before the start of my placement, around the time that Prince Harry was being married to Meghan Markle, who are now the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. Um, this myth found roots in the 1940s as a claim by a writer called J.A. Rogers, who concluded that Charlotte's broad nostrils and heavy lips in this portrait on the screen by Alan Ramsey, um, coupled with an ob the observation by her contemporary, Horace Walpole, that she had nostrils spreading too wide and a mouth that has the same fault was evident enough for Rogers that she um, must be of Negro strain, as he, as he called it. Um, this theory was then popularized in the 90s by writer Mario de Valdez y Cocom, who argued that Rogers is correct in his conclusion. And he goes on to say, and I quote, that her unmistakable appearance and Negroid physiognomy, as depicted by Ramsey in this portrait, was inherited from a distant ancestor who he believes and claims is Moorish, and he then attributes this to blackness, and that, and then also claims that the Sousa family from which Charlotte is descended from was the black branch of the Portuguese royal house. And if you're thinking from this, then that's well and good and relatively interesting, but what about other portraits that exist of Charlotte that show a different perspective or a different narrative to what I've just said. And Valdez has an answer to you and says that artists and particularly court painters who are painted to the royal family were reliant on their customer satisfaction for their, for their work, um, to be paid for their work and for the patronage. And in order to make be motivated to soften or erase these apparent very obvious features um, in order to Charlotte as a conventional beauty that I into more in the contemporary schools of the time. However, Valdez argues that he himself has his abolitionist sympathies and leads to his marriage to the art of Dido Bell, who is a famously known mixed race woman who was the daughter of an African slave mother and a white um, father who is a member of the of the high of upper classes in Britain who was brought here uh, to live with his family and who is the subject of Amma Sante's feature film Belle and um, would have noted him like, these features in her portraits and he even emphasized them um, to be sent um, to all corners of the empire which in turn would further the court of abolition um, and I as historical arguments go um, it's and a very positive one and for one it's conflicting and contradictory nature and uses portrait of historical evidence to justify itself but then also that literature is unreliable and um, it's reliant on so many assumptions one we're assuming what the artist is thinking and his motivations for painting and um, it's unreliable it's on it's based on the un unreliable notion of contemporary observations and he also uses premise that he has absolutely no evidence for, provides no evidence for. And the argument essentially was that Charlotte had, or was perceived to have had from this, from this portrait, wide nose and lips. And well, wide noses and lips are typically attributed to people of African descent. And therefore Charlotte is of African descent, which is a very simple argument, which doesn't quite work. Um, how does it twist the truth and to see his own needs and own narrative is of course bad historical practice, but the story he weaves is enough to capture the imagination of what could be. It flirts enough with historical fact that if you squint and tilt your head, it could be true. It's a drama, a mystery and a conspiracy all in one. That's more interesting than the historical fact. And that's enough for, for Charlotte 
to be forever intertwined with this myth. And it has to be, it could be argued that this story and this narrative that he's, he creates, um, the best drama and the potential of this and the greater potential of the myth itself was recently portrayed in the Netflix series Bridgerton, a Regency romance period drama produced by Shonda Rhimes and created by Chris Van Dusen. The show takes direct inspiration from this myth and the creator in his own says that exists in an alternative history in which Queen Charlotte's mixed heritage was not only well established, but was transformative for black people and other people of color in England. And this image shows Golda Rochevelle, an actress of both Viennese and English in the role of Charlotte. The series has been very successful and it's easy to see why. It combines the lust and romance of a bodice ripper, the over the top theatrics and drama of a reality show, the incredible for that's an incredibly formal setting of the upper class of the Regency of, of Regency England, excuse me. And through its diversing choices, breathes new life into the concept of period drama. Costuming is integral in conveying Van Dusen's reality for what Bridgerton is set in, as it allows the blackness to be interwoven with the fabric of the reality. Of, of Bridgerton and for the audience to see how blackness as a concept influences the preconceived ideas of the era. This is embodied by the interpretation of the Georgian wig. Bridgerton pays homage to the powdered white wigs and coiffed fanciful hairstyles and hair pieces we traditionally think of and, and through Rochevelle's depiction of Queen Charlotte gives it new life taking inspiration from popular culture. Wig in this image she's wearing is directly influenced by the wig worn by Beyonce in her portrayal as Cleopatra and Austin Powers and when I found that out it was just all my interests are aligning at once and it was amazing. <laughs> However, Bridgerton falls victim to the need to over explain its creative choices. It does make and it makes the fantasy. Up until the fourth episode, it exists in of itself as a costume period drama that uses diverse and inclusive, inclusive casting in order to reflect and give new perspectives of the typical imagery of the Regency period. The audience is under no illusions that this is in any way historically accurate. However, it then chooses to experience a sort of existential crisis and has Lady Danbury, who is played by Adjua Ando, a black actress in a conversation with the protagonist, the Duke of Hastings, who is played by and says that we were two separate societies divided by colour until the king fell in love with one of us. Love your grace conquers all. This is the only indication of the realities of racism in the entire series. And the implication of this statement is that, is that in this setting, racism exists or did exist, but it was able to be overcome by the marriage of a king to a mixed race woman. The realities of racism is not quite successful in, in this setting and can't really exist as one. It takes the audience out. Hi, sorry, something happened there. <laughs> so, to, so to continue, that quote um, basically brings the realities of racism into the existence of Bridgerton, which isn't quite doesn't quite work. And due to current events, um, the audience is well aware that a black person marrying into the British monarchy does not and cannot solve any of race is reality and two to coin a term from the marble is the nexus of this fictional reality everything that happens is because of her existence as a mixed race woman married married to the british married into the british royal family allows everything else to happen 
Now that the audience is aware that the character is also aware of racism, setting in this period of history does not work as it's reliant on the contextualizing racism from the institution of slavery that is inherent in, the, in Georgian history and British history as a whole. It can be said that despite the thought, Bridgerton works as a thought experiment for the myth itself that it's based on, and it shows that shows how pervasive racism is that it cannot even be avoided in this highly fictionalized, historically inaccurate modern interpretation. So the final portrait I would talk about is this one by Johann Georg Weissness, which I also spoke about in my original podcast. This was painted in 761 on, on the occasion of George III, and the artist uses all the conventions he can, all the conventions he can in order to convey her as young and virginal, and that she has sufficient wealth to stop. Her family's dual seat of Mecklenburg Strelitz background, alluding to her aristocratic background. The bracelet around her wrist was a miniature of her betrothed King George III. The father is not the only person in the portrait. The person described as her black servant in the official description of this painting in the foreground position below her. It can be assumed he is kneeling and only the side of his face can be seen his, because his gaze is focused adoringly up at Charlotte as the focus of the painting and of, and of his existence. He offers Charlotte a basket of roses and she delicately accepts a single pink one. He is dressed in a red livery and a silver collar is chained around him, making clear that it wasn't already obvious he is a safe person and he belongs to her. This portrait that not only shows that not only does Charlotte exist in a world where slavery was happening, her position meant that she actively participated and benefited from the practice. This is in line with of course, one of the practice of enslaved people and the labor of the plantations and cotton plantations in the Americas, but also being brought to Europe and directly into the homes of the aristocracy, primarily as pages, personal servants, but also as playthings akin to a toy or a pet for children and women. And two, the use of the black slave, servant, or page as an artistic device to convey the primary sister's wealth, position, beauty, and power. To continue to attribute attribute blackness to historical figures such as Charlotte. What are we saying to the person's portrait who is not only enslaved, but enslaved in the name of the crown for which she represents? Gallery and museum collections in Britain are littered with the works of art like this that make direct reference to enslaved people existing in Britain and navigating this piece and, and who also navigate these spaces, but the individual stories have been lost and they now only exist in relation to the people and system that oppressed them. Though it's not possible to uncover the true significance of the contributions that these people made, such as the person in this, in this portrait, it's imperative that museums and galleries as the beholders of these objects and as institutions of knowledge and learning are dedicated in covering of what is still salvageable, and that they maintain an investigative, critical, but compassionate approach to their works of art the representation or misrepresentations of black historical figures. By allowing for narratives such as mine as a British person of African descent to, descent to exist in these spaces, we allow for different perspectives that only, that only exist and are only allowed to exist because of lived experience. And, it, and for those narratives like mine to be considered as a possibility, we're opening up to what could have possibly happened to these people. To conclude, the myth of Queen Charlotte's African ancestry, ancestry sorry, is incongruent to the realities of monarchy and its reliance on the premise of blue-bloodedness and the superior bloodline to justify its power and position and to continue to perpetuate it, absolves the institution and British itself from its centralized role in the slave trade, which, will, which further injustice there's the injustices that were committed against the people, such as that in the such as the person in this portrait. Thank you, Vanessa. Vanessa is, does that bring your presentation to an end? Yes, it does. Oh, thank you so much, Vanessa. I'm, I'm, you might be where we had a little 
problem with the sound. Yeah, but, I thought so. And that was <laughs> that was even more disappointing because the research is so fascinating and, and we'll pick up how we, we might kind of distribute some of your research. And But I'd like to say thank you. But I'm, I'm conscious we're running a little bit short and, and wrap up our session. So I'd like to bring Errol and Karantama and Vanessa back on uh, to, to answer just a couple of quick questions. Can you all hear me? Errol, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. yes, I can hear you. I think one question that I'd just like to put to you, uh, well, really put to you both, um, was a question about um, the staff and the diversity of staff in the New Museum School. Um, could you just talk a little bit about the, sta the, the, the staffing? Do you mean the people running the museum? Yes, yes I'm just re screening back to the question. There was quite a lot of... Oh, yes, it, it's from Marginesca. Um, uh, uh, is the staff as diverse um, uh, uh, as the student pool? Yes, yes, they are. Um, yes. Um, I mean, um, the per we, we're actually running a new museum school um, residency um, program. Obviously, I'm the director of the program, so I consider myself as coming from a diverse background. And also, um, the the manager of the residency program um, is a um, um, found. She's a member of Museum Detox, um, and actually, I should say, our chair. Um, we, who has just recently joined us is Miranda Miranda Lowe, who um, some of you may know from the Natural History Museum, yes. who's um, uh, yeah a, a woman of colour who is a natural history curator. So yeah, we yeah. we do have it. So, thank you very much, and and perhaps to Vanessa and Errol quickly. Um, well, uh, Vanessa's research gives fascinating new readings of histories that are mm. familiar, and yet obviously not familiar to us. Could you just give us some more examples of the kind of research projects that you're leading at the New Museum School? Okay, so um, at the moment with the residency program, we have um, uh, placements at the uh, Collections Trust, which is looking at information systems and descriptions of uh, collections and how they can be um, decolonized. Um, and we're working with the National Trust as well. We have on the description of historic houses and the um, people who lived in these houses and the stories that are associated with them. And also a kind of related area, really English heritage. Um, um, we can be looking at some of the, um, you know, historic buildings as, as well and, and the backgrounds to these buildings in terms of the people themselves and, you know, um, how, 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 you know, the wealth, where the wealth came from to, to build these places. Karantama, could I just ask you, were you aware of, of the kind of research projects that were going on in the New Museum School, or, or is this some new, new insights for you as well? No, I am aware, yeah. I've seen Errol talk before, actually, and um, I think what they do is amazing. Um, yeah, I, like, funny enough, um, I, we've got some young people who were part of the New Museum School a few years ago, I think. Um, and yeah, I think, like, things like that, are, I mean, give them all, the, all your support. <laughs> if there's one thing that anyone um, listening today can do is give New Museum School their support um, and other organisations like Museum Detox and Museum as well. Mm. And Vanessa, can I can I give you uh, the 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 last word? What are your plans for the next stage of res your research? I mean, what what have you? What, where are you going to place this? Could you could you talk us through what your thoughts are on this? Yeah, of course. I feel like um, this research has to kind of happen organically. It was something that when I came across it before my um, before I. Uh, apply to the new museum school it's what kind of inspired me to go for it because of these narratives that weren't really told and it's like this directly is related to me and my experience and then the same the, the same thing that's happening at the time which was Meghan Markle's introduction into the royal family for which we're now seeing was not as harmonious as was as was perceived I feel like my next course for this research would 
kind of see where Queen Charlotte pops up again in our in popular culture if she does again, if there's some sort of um, harmony or addressing of Britain's role in the slave trade, which has actually never been done, and how this would happen. Um, I think I'm very reliant on kind of what the industry is willing to do and how that relates to how we should then move on. Yeah. I'm, if I may, I'm going to round up with some thanks the session before I move on to introduce Nigel. So Errol, <laughs> Karen Tamar, Vanessa, th thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for finishing off such a great conference day. And, and thank you from the sector for leading and pioneering on, on such important work. And we're going to get the benefit of that in the sector for years to come. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'm now going to, oh, yes, thank you. Um, I'm now going to move on to Nigel and introduce my colleague on the committee, Nigel Sadler. That's calling Nigel, who I, I know is, is joining us from Axminster in Devon. Nigel, welcome. Good afternoon. What have you made of today's session? You, we've given you the task of, of rounding everything up for us. Yeah, and I've only got 15 minutes. Wow. Right. <laughs> uh, you can hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to start by saying when I started in museum work 30 years ago, we were told that museums were neutral spaces and as curators our personal opinions and in the political agendas of the managing organizations had to be hidden when we put on exhibitions and even when we work with collections museums have their voice they tell a story in a particular way curators were trained in a certain way and for many years these curators felt they could do exhibitions on many subjects around collections they managed fortunately there's been a big shift in the last two decades into making museums representative of the public opinions and to find ways to tell stories of conflicted histories and to have relevance to all the communities they serve. Today's sessions actually highlight that we've not come far enough, but there are organisations out there that are pushing uh, the pace to try and make sure we are going to make sure that social justice is at the core of everything we do. So today's sessions cover the diversity of social justice and how museums and cultural organisations should be engaging and challenging the traditional stories and approaches taken by museums. The first session was based on race and anti-racism. I think we're all impressed by Zandra Yeaman's job title, which is Curator of Discomfort at Glasgow Museum. This is an attempt to address the lack of some aspects of history in the cultural spaces and issues around the story of empire, colonialism and slavery and how the story was told in Scotland. The first session looked at the development of engagement on subjects of race and how museums have been more than just focusing on things such as Black History Month. Cities like Liverpool, Glasgow, London, Birmingham are now looking at addressing through community engagement. But this is a difficult term. What is community and what is engagement? Most seems to be short term projects and maybe seen as trying to bring more, bring more people into the museum from greater diversity. Do we listen to community? Do, do museums speak for and to the community? We need to change the power structure rather than the museums telling us what they're doing and getting the community to lead the agenda of the museums. Can there be equity in the power dynamics? But also it came across what defines an expert and what are experts we are experts in. The second session uh, was on how we represented, represented the stories of the LGBTQ community. How the organization's letter project was built on community involvement using the words, experiences and emotions of individuals written in letters. Queer Britain illustrates projects can be through global research partnerships, corporate sponsors, in their case Levi, who has inclusions built into their policies since 1950s, also local communities and the individual engagement. All these levels were as important to create the overall aims, but one clear thing they gave across as a message was it all relies on trust. In the same project, their partnership with the post office, such as boxes in the community post office and a free post address, was essential to help all and get feedback from regardless of social background. Meaningful representations aim to address, reduce, or address and reduce the phobias against LGBTQ plus communities. 
The afternoon session starts off with just outcomes that look more widely at social injustice, ranging from historic eugenics and its interpretations, racism and how to portray the artistic response and items related to the civil rights movement in the USA, and to modern day homelessness. How interpretation of objects on display has often been biased, as well as how and what items are collected. The diversity in the subjects covered in the films showed the wide range of issues being faced by those in the museum and cultural sector. The Museum of Homelessness, for example, put on an exhibition about how individual homeless people have been affected by the government regulation changes. It was their voice that drove the exhibition. One thing that came out of this uh, uh, session in my mind was the museum's role behind a venue for exhibitions. Can museums find ways to provide training, jobs, resources to the economically or socially disadvantaged? Can they act as community mentors? Can museums take on bigger roles in the community? For example, the Museum of Homelessness is planning on introducing a flat salary structure so all employees are equal. Many museums still want visitors users to come to their own conclusions. The National Museum of African American History and Culture, for example, wants to provide as much information as possible to allow visitors to formulate their own perspectives. This appears to be a, a going back in time to what we were told 30 years ago. However, they are doing it from a position where they're making better choices on what is collected and how it's collected, how the objects are being interpreted by the community. And again, it's also reflecting on, is it telling the narrative that relates to the viewer and the audience? How do we find out what museums hold in their collections that might relate more to us or to tell a different narrative? Do we have to just to rely on what is on display and the narrative fed to us? And as museum professionals, how are we supposed to be addressing this? Another thing that came across today is the use of language and the terms we use. Sometimes used to engage, sometimes used as a weapon. For this reason, community engagement is essential, especially at all levels of the museum structure. Interpreting the objects, exhibition planning, collecting proposals, and outreach. It is the community driving the political agenda through campaigning and direct support to the community members that museums need to get access to. However, museums have to also be aware of becoming a tick box. We don't just do this as an exercise, there must be substance to what we do. Museums might be quick to say the right thing, but much slower in actions they take. For example, when museums laid off people due to COVID-19, they laid off the less qualified part-time workers, for example, in the shops, the cafe workers and cleaners, which prejudice women, people from ethnic minorities, and those on the lowest income. <clears throat> so they may, may have, should have actually thought long and hard about some of the decisions they were taking at the time to address some of their social responsibilities. The final session this afternoon really addressed how we create diversity in the employees in the sector and how we can address the inequalities. Arts Emergency addressed uh, the barriers to social justice and how can we do the jobs we want to and how do we learn about potential jobs we want that would engage us. If, art is, if arts elitist, so how do these disadvantaged young people get involved or engage within the arts sector? What are the inequalities in the creative industries? Should it be who you know rather than your personal merits that help you get a job? And if confidence is the thing that, that we are looking for in a lot of staff, how do we provide young people with that confidence? It wasn't just asking the questions, they were telling us that we need to mentor young people to give them the confidence. We need to take on the challenges and find ways um, within our own positions, how can we change the position of privilege we have um, within, the, within the sector to support other people who would, who would class as non-privileged or underprivileged. The new museum school then looked at who works in the museum sector and how museums collect, interpret and exhibit items. This also wants to address, they also, they also want museums to address the workforce and how they are treated and supported. Museums need to reflect diversity of all kinds in the sector. We need to find the talents based on skill and potential. <clears throat> For example, economics often restrict young people's chances, so maybe museums need to find sponsorship or internal training programmes. We know what needs to change but we need to find ways to do this. This isn't just about rights, but also how a diverse workforce benefits the institution through such things as reinterpreting of collections and working with a wider range of community groups, except especially in outreach. Finally, Vanessa Alton's presentation gives an example on, on how we need to reinterpret artwork depicting black figures and how the view of others can just be as valid as, as historic interpretations, in this case by a graduate from the new museum school. I will end with this thought. Sometimes, what is said this morning was that museums become preoccupied by museum issues rather than by social issues. As a sector, we need to become more aware of how we address this. This is both an individual and organisational issue. How can we as individuals address this and make the sector different?
I believe I'm also supposed to say thank you. So I would also like to thank all of today's presenters for a thought provoking day. And I'd like to thank all of you who attended today. We look forward to welcoming you back tomorrow for day two of the Working International Conference organized by ICOM UK in partnership with the National Museum Directors Council and with the support of the British Council and Curatorial Support from Barker Langham. Tomorrow morning, there's a virtual coffee morning between nine and 9.45. Um, I think you've had to sign up in advance for that. Um, and the presentations on the theme of museums and sustainability start at 10 a.m. tomorrow.